uh, to the closing plenary here. We have been together for three days. I think we had wonderful intensive discussions. Um, I heard so many inspirational stories and inputs. And I'm happy to be here with a fantastic uh, panel of people with loads and loads of experience and knowledge uh, that they're going to share with us. And I hope that you will also share your experiences. And also, if you have questions at any moment, please raise your hands and you will be most welcome to ask them. So what I would like to ask now to anybody is to put away your, uh, your phones unless you're tweeting or on LinkedIn <laughs> or WhatsApp. on Instagram or Snapchat <laughs> about the event or you're taking notes of this meeting that you will share with all of us. <laughs> Otherwise, let's, let's be offline a little bit then, right? Because we need Simone attention Filippini. for this issue which is important. So I'm Simone Filippini. I'm a former diplomat and ambassador. I led two different NGOs. I was also politically active as the international secretary of a national party in the Netherlands. And now I'm working and thinking about how to promote leadership to achieve the sustainable development goals. And basically, that is the issue of today's closing plenary. You know, because if we want to have successful globalization, we need sustainable peace. If we want sustainable peace, we need inclusive and sustainable social economic development. Leave no one behind. Get rid of inequalities. And to get that done, we need leaders who drive this transformation. You know, during the last days, we have heard a lot of positive developments by corporate partners, also by goodwilling other people, um, government representatives, peoples from the not-for-profit organizations. But still, the question is, how do we get where we want to go? How do we promote and drive that world forward that we want to achieve. And so we have this fantastic panel here, but first I go to you. So I want to ask you, uh, because I want to see a little bit who's in the room. So uh, please, women, raise your hands. Okay, so kind of half. And then continents, who's from Europe? Who's from Africa? Great, who's from Asia, Oceania? The Americas? Oh, lots of Americans also. No. Wow. Oh. So, so we can see who is from the business? Who's business sector? Business sector? Social enterprise? Out of business sector, social enterprise? There are a few. Who's from, from a not-for-profit? Great. And uh, government representatives or local government representatives? Okay, so it's a nice mix here. Fantastic. So it's good for the panel to know who's in the room so that we can, uh, so we know there's a lot of diverse knowledge and experience and expertise here. So I have a first question to you guys. So if you hear the two words, successful globalization, what are the top of mind, what is the top of mind word that you hear, that, you f that, that top pops up in you? Can you s just yell something? <laughs> Inclusion, integration, integration. Harmony. harmony, sorry, rhythm, freedom, freedom. Justice. justice, social justice, diversity, equality, equality. equality. speech, <laughs> speed, speed, trust, trust. opportunity. opportunity. Peace, wow. If we think of the sustainable development goals, all those elements are in there, right? It's really interesting. And then I have one other question for you now, to start off with. If you hear the word government, think of your own government or any other government, what is the first top of mind word there? Uh, bureaucracy. Fairness, bureaucracy. Bureaucracy. <laughs> Regulation. <laughs> Chaos. Mm, Corruption, oh my God. money laundering, oligarchy, arbitration, slow, slow. 
Okay. Well, I. Not Sorry? Okay, but okay. Non challenge. Okay. Anybody there? Okay. So I, I think this, this already sets a little bit the stage for our panel here <laughs> uh, because th these are challenging uh, 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 notions. Um, so we have here Helen Clark uh, sitting there, former Prime Minister of New Zealand, former boss of UNDP, the UN Development Programme. She was closely involved with both the Millennium Development Goals and setting up the Sustainable Development Goals, so the follow-up of the Millennium Development Goals. She is super active, flying around the world, promoting justice, peace, inclusion, women's rights, what have you. So she is one of the top women in the world, I always say, and I mean that. And then we have Steve Kilalia. Steve is a businessman turned kind of data scientist, a peace person, and he has developed and is now the, basically the, the proud uh, initiator of the Global Peace Index. Um, the Positive Peace Report, uh, he, they publish also a report on the economic uh, pluses of peace. So he will talk a little bit about that to start off with. We have Susana Malcora, she has been in business for 25 years in Argentina. She was a, an Assistant Secretary General of, Under Secretary General of the UN. She was the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Argentina. She's also one of those top women, very inspirational. Um, and she will talk about uh, the issues of, of today also from a little bit of a perspective of top women. Then we have the Vice Mayor of Cascais, uh, um, Miguel Pinto Luz. He, will, uh, he has been central government responsible as a Vice Minister. He is now the Deputy Ch uh, uh, Mayor of so he has both perspectives also of local governance and national governance, can, can bridge those issues. And of course, then we have last but certainly not least, Theresa Ribeiro um, from Portugal, State Secretary for European and International Affairs. Um, also from a kind of semi, you were a scientist, I think, university professor, and you were also in business and you turned politician. So many different perspectives here. And, um, and, and you will say something about the economic side to the uh, equation. So let's start with uh, Steve. Um, Steve, can you s say something uh, to us about, say, the economic value of peace? I, I, I read in the report that you guys write uh, that the global impact of violence in the world is nearly 14.8 trillion US dollars on an annual basis which is 12.4% of global GDP, and it increased by 16% since 2012. Uh, if we, for example, look at a country like Syria, the economic cost of violence is 68% of GDP. It's like staggering. And in violent countries, economic cost of violence is 19 times higher than uh, in, in uh, uh, affected countries affected by conflict. So the more peaceful a country, less it spends on violence. So there's a positive correlation, apparently. Can you say something about this? About this yep. positive peace? Yeah, sure. So we'll start, well, $15 trillion or 12.4% or or of global GDP is a Loud lot of money. Clear, huh? So and that's yep. a conservative estimate. Now, just to give you an idea, no one here can imagine a world which is going to be peaceful. But a one percent improvement or a 10 percent improvement we could all imagine. So a one percent improvement in the cost of violence to the global economy, it's about 150 billion dollars. That's the size of all o o e uh, overseas developmental aid in 2018. If you've got a 10 percent improvement in the cost of violence to the global economy, that is the equivalent of all foreign direct investment, whether it comes out of Europe, China, Japan, US, anywhere. And similarly, it would be the same as adding three new economies to the world. That would be the equivalent of Denmark, Switzerland and Ireland. So the amounts of money trapped in violence are truly astronomical. But I won't go into it now, but as the questions tease it out further on, I'm going to talk about positive peace. Those attitudes, institutions and structures which create and sustain peaceful societies. And that we combine it with the concepts of systems thinking, a radical way 
of being able to transform the societies we're living in today to solve the decay which we can see in the Western democracies. At this point, I'll stop because I know Simone wants to turn this into a really interactive conversation. Yeah, you, I've drilled those people. I whipped them you under the British uh, Parliament. Sarah. I whipped them already into discipline. <laughs> I think maybe a little bit over the top <laughs> even. Steve doesn't <laughs> even dare to talk more than two <laughs> minutes. But, uh, um, <laughs> so you have the, you mentioned eight pillars uh, in the positive. Are, are those pillars, can you talk a just a little bit about those pillars? Are they sure. uh, so equal like with each other? So if we start to look at positive peace, what's transformational about it? It's actually, to actually identified through statistics. So it comes down to eight different blocks. So the Institute for Economics and Peace, we've got the Global Peace Index, which is the world's leading measure of global peacefulness. We've then run statistical analysis against 5,000 different data sets, indexes and attitudinal surveys to understand those factors which are most statistically related. Now, once we've done that, we use further analysis to now break it down into clumps. And that forms eight different blocks. And that's what we call positive peace. But what's important, it doesn't work causally. They all interact together as in a system. And as you start to look at a system and the way a society works, you're now interested in the relationships and flows. So societies today, and you can see it in the way you all think here, you can see it in the way governments operate and the way the media covers governments. We think of events. So President Trump, for example, we all think of the event of the election of President Trump and what was the cause for him being elected. But what's more important in systems thinking is the relationships and flows which cause the events to come about. And that creates a profound, different way of understanding a system. So, Simone said, what pillars are most important? The answer is none. We <laughs> look and think in terms of causeless correlations the interrelationships and flows. So three of the pillars, one's well-functioning government, free flow of information, which can be epitomised by a free press, or low levels of corruption. Does government create a corrupt environment or does corruption corrupt the government? Does the free flow of information affect the government or does the government affect the free flow of information or does the corrup corruption affect free flow of information? It can't pull it okay. apart. And now, generally, when you're thinking of cause and effect, it comes out of the study of physics or empiric science, and that is not the way systems work. I'll stop there, but I can keep going. Mm. Okay, yeah, no, you're very enthusiastic, and, and it is really uh, super interesting. I, I can advise everybody to read the reports, because it's, they're very inspirational, and they really give insights, and they're, uh, they're methodologically sound. So that's mm. important. Helen, if, if you listen, or you, you, of course you know the, uh, the about the eight uh, pillars, if you, uh, so let's focus a little bit on the government one. Um, so how do you look at that? The role of government, is that a leading one? Is that a following one? Is that, uh, does government have to interact? Where, where does it start? Because we have seen that leaders don't, uh, are not able to really perform, right? To, to come up, to deliver. So what needs to happen there? Well, I think you know, government doesn't occur in a vacuum, does it? It, uh -huh. it, uh, it? it has a context. And for me, what is extremely important in maintaining peace, which is so critical for development, war always takes development into regression, is that there is a high degree of social cohesion and a sense of fairness and basic rule of law and that governments show that they are prepared to uphold those things, to not leave people behind, to give people voice and, 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 and to say, and genu genuinely respect and, and listen to that. Uh, you know, societies that hang together, governments that are engaged and listen and give entry points for people, in the end, these are gonna be more peaceful societies and they will get more results. And, and if you look at the backlog that already has been uh, um, ha has been determined by, by the UN, has reported on the backlog in the SDGs. There's, I think even yesterday, a new report on increasing backlog in achieving the SDGs. What is the role of governments then? So what is, and, and, and how can we improve that? 
so that they perform better, that they deliver better? Mm. Well, leadership is important at all levels of society, right? I mean, governments have a role, private sector's got a role, civil society's got a role, everybody can contribute. But I think for the SDGs, what is, is very important is that from the highest level, a vision for achieving them is, uh, is communicated. And then beyond the vision, because it's easy, I guess, to articulate a vision and a strategy and a policy, but you have to have implementation capacity. And from my uh, many years in government and then, uh, I guess, advising and supporting governments from, from UNDP, it, it's getting the skills and competencies to actually carry through on the strategies and plans, which is important. And that means uh, being able to drive a public service, actually create and staff a public uh, a service, it, uh, have the interactions with the other key actors in the economy. So there's a lot of skills involved in not just developing policies, but making them happen. Implementation uh -huh. capacity is critical. Was it lonely at the top? No, no, it wasn't lonely at the top. I mean, by the time you've got to the top, you have formed a lot of networks uh, to get there. You can be lonely at the top if you want to, but why would you be? You need to have your, your, your colleagues, of course, your family, your, your networks. Why be lonely? Now, in terms of being able, and I also would like to mm. ask you, Susanna, it was mm. in, and, and uh, Teresa, but maybe also you, Miguel, was it lonely when you were a minister mm. or at the mm in a top position to, to share vulnerabilities, to ask questions if you didn't know things, which you couldn't ask maybe your staff because you felt vulnerable then? Well, clearly there is a, a problem of connecting with people when you are at the highest levels in government. And that is perceived by, by the people. Uh, you know, it was very interesting to listen to the reaction of the audience speaking very highly of successful globalization, so we have globalists here, that's clear, but it's speaking very poorly about governments, mm -hmm. which shows that there is a problem of relationship between the peoples and their governments. And uh, this is at the heart of the tensions we have before us these days. Uh, unless uh, governments can understand and connect with the needs of people and are able to deliver on those needs, we will keep having these uh, sings, these people singing new songs of uh, nationalism, protectionism, xenophobia, which are very dangerous. And to me, it's very interesting, and this closed the loops, the loop, Agenda 2030, in a way, addresses all the needs. And this is something that all governments have agreed to in 2015. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that it has not yet been mainstream as the political agenda in every place. Mm. And I mean, this is a universal agenda. This is not an agenda imposed on the South, on the developing world. It's an agenda that applies to the developed world also. And when people reacted here and talk about diversity, inclusion, income equality, these are things that are a problem in the South but also Absolutely. are a problem in many Western developed countries. So what I'm saying here is, it's not that we don't have the tools. It looks like we are not able to implement them properly, or at least people don't feel the results on their own daily lives. And that is what we have to work on, because unless we break that vicious cycle, we will keep having mm -hmm. a reaction against governments and that is chaos. Yeah, and, and so uh, both you and Helen uh, were invo or are involved in an initiative to stand up against what you called in an article in The Guardian, the rise of the strongman. Do, do you think that there is a, a relationship between not uh, achieving the sustainable development goals or backlogging on the realization and the rise, the, uh, the rise of strongmen and more nationalistic political uh, occurrence and such? Well, it's a complex system. Of course, it's never and, very and it's very hard to answer in, in a minute. Of course. I'll do my best, and I'm sure <laughs> Helen can, can support me. Uh, what is clear is that there is a, a, a backlash, there is a movement towards more authoritarian perspectives. This is clear, we see it. We see it all over the world. We see it in my region, we see it in Asia, in Europe, 
And that is as a reaction of people voting, because this comes out of electoral uh, cycles, voting against the system. And that means that the system, as I said earlier, does not deliver to the people, but also it means that people sort of listen to a music that is more authoritarian because it looks magic. It looks like it's going to solve all the problems. Helen and I, as you mentioned, are working very hard on gender questions on women empowerment because we fear not only that this cycle is going to a, a slow the implementation of new policies on gender, but it will push back on existing policies. Mm -hmm. And we see that happening. We saw that happening in New York in the discussion of, of, of the Commission CSW. for the Status of Women yep. two weeks ago. We see it in my part of the world. We see it here in Europe. So we have to be very, very vigilant because these issues matter and make a difference. Mm -hmm. And the questions of a rights-based society should be at the heart of good governance and the implementation of Agenda 2030. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, any reactions so far from the floor? Yeah, just just stand up and s yell. <laughs> Harsh. Oh, somebody with the mic is coming up. Mic. Okay, great. Yes. <laughs> the dog in the manger system. Okay, question? Whereas, whereas, whereas a leader knows that he cannot deliver mm -hmm. on the promises of government, but he doesn't want to leave, but he wants to play to the guard to show that he can do something. He knows he cannot deliver, he is not delivering, but he wants to play to the guard every single day, and he comes in the face of the president every single day, like coming in front of my house to play the God. And I have said, we should not elect a mayor to play the God. We elected a mayor to think of how our city will be played. Okay. And yeah. re in reaction to that. Now, can you round up? Yes. Because otherwise we will, I want to have yes. others. In reaction to that, I, I was going to live here and, you know, do what I can do. I decided to run for office. Okay. So I am thinking that the, the, the solution is that citizens have to come up. That if you want things to change, you jump in and do something. Mm -hmm. Okay. Th thanks so much. Um, very good point. Yeah. Um, so, well, uh, Miguel, I think that is that question Perfect. is totally <laughs> for you. <laughs> so the disconnect between the responsibles and the population. So how do you perceive that? And what do you do as a vice mayor of Qashqaish to try to prevent this from happening and to mm -hmm. promote that inclusive uh, uh, development and, and the connections? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the question because it's right on the spot. It's a bullseye <laughs> question for what we are doing right now in, in my municipality. Because I, I agree with Suzanne when, when she s uh, said that we are experiencing a backlash of authoritarian regimes growing in Europe, for, for instance. But you are, not, you are not seeing that kind of trend in local governments. You are, you are seeing quite the opposite. Because we are trying new solutions, what I like to say that is democracy 2.0. We are experiencing now participatory budgets. We are experiencing now uh, systems of uh, the gamification of citizenship, awarding uh, uh, points to citizens for be, uh, good behaviors. So in local government, uh, what 
I'm seeing right now in, in the 21st century, in the, in the beginning of 21st century, is quite the opposite of what we are experiencing at the national level. Because at the national level, uh, 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 I completely agree with you, uh, 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 the, the mandates are, are, are very short. You can't establish a long-term strategy for, for your citizens. And in the end of the day, you have, in the middle of a crisis, what happened to Papandreou in, in Greece, what happened to Cameron in, in, in UK, and they can't deliver what they, they've, they've told all the citizens they will deliver. In local government, you have long-term and stable mandates. Uh, for instance, I'm deputy mayor now for 15 years and my, with a, a stable majority in local government in Cascais, and you see that all over the place in Portugal, and you see that in Europe, but you don't see the same trend at the national level. So I, I like to say that the success of, of, of globalization now uh, is based on all the citizens by, by, by themselves because all the citizens are prepared for this global world because all of you use social media, all of you use all the technologies, you are aware of all the, the possibilities that you have to be and act as a social citizen. In next level, in local government, we are already adapting for this glo uh, globalization and we are very well adapted and you have networks of cities worldwide, you have the share of knowledge, good practices that we are, the participatory budget of Cascais is being copied to, to New York, for instance. And Cascais is a 220,000 inhabitant city, and New York is a 10 million cit uh, uh, citizen, so, uh, city, uh, city, city. So, uh, uh, in the end of the day, cities and mayors are doing more for globalization, for uh, uh, the success of globalization than national and su uh, supranational institutions, and m later on I could talk about European Union, for, for instance, because it's uh, uh, somehow our governing body uh, uh, um, of multilateralism uh, strategy for Europe for the last 60 years, and it's not solving the, 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 the mm -hmm. problems of, of, of Europeans. And, uh, uh, but I, I think uh, uh, nowadays central government and the Portuguese government is doing a huge uh, 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 movement on decentralizing more and more for local uh, 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 government mm -hmm. uh, 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 and with huge success right now uh, the first figures are showing that local government can do more with less a more efficient efficient delivering the solutions that people want yep. we have uh, better solutions to listen uh, 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 to our citizens in the end of the day I would say that in local government you have you have less ideology and more pragmatism but but Miguel no I I, I think I, I tend to agree with you. I, I, ask, I wonder whether it's enough, so whether that upward movement uh, is enough to force national governments to produce better results. And still we see citizens also from cities who are doing well to, uh, to produce election results that are quite pointing into a, a little bit of a different direction sometimes. So I, I would like to, uh, you would well, like well, to react now, and then I would like well, Teresa just a to word, ask. Because local government has such an incredible role in achieving yep. sustainable development goals. Often the competencies are down with uh, local government. I think the key thing is that central government makes sure that local government has the access That's to it. the funding sources that it needs, because you see a lot of decentralizations where the functions decentralize, but the money doesn't come with it, and that makes local government very grumpy. But I think there are incredible uh, examples around our world of, mm -hmm. of cities and towns and counties across continents where they've done incredible things. And, and central government can learn some lessons from this, from the engagement with, with citizens, from the responsiveness, from the strategic mm -hmm. visioning and planning. So, you know, I very much identify with yes. what the deputy mayor has said. Yeah, and you mm -hmm. can also see that all over the world, uh, cities are now getting together, building networks to help each other and, and share pr best practices, right? To see 40 cities, sustainable yeah. cities, all kinds of cities, uh, smaller cities, larger cities, all getting together to try to move things forward. But the enabling, building the enabling environment, the rules and regulations is, of course, mm. a role of national governments eh, to enable others to flourish and also the European Union. And maybe as a state secretary for, uh, for foreign affairs, you, you could tell us a little bit about that connection. How do you look at that? And also the question of Miguel about the European Union. Okay, um, thank yeah. you very much. And thank you very much for having me here today. 
Um, and let me clarify something. I'm, uh, I'm responsible for international affairs and development cooperation, not for European policy, for European uh, affairs. I was mm. Secretary of State for European Affairs in my past, but I will be, I, I'm very glad to be here and to talk also about uh, uh, the European perspective, if I may say. Um, I completely agree uh, uh, on... Um, uh, on what uh, Susanna just mentioned about, uh, about the distance between uh, governments and citizens. And what the irony of all this is that if you want to achieve uh, sustainable development goals, you need political will, you need political commitment, you need government at all levels. So, and this is the, the challenge. How can you again bridge with all these different actors? We need, we need all the actors involved, all the stakeholders, from citizens to uh, private sector, to, to all, all are mobilized and all have to be mobilized for this immense task which is the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. But we need political will. And how can we... Uh, and you said something when you... When we were... Uh, what, what, what is the first... Uh, the f some thoughts when, you, when we say government and you said trust. How can we build trust? And one of the problems, uh, and this came with globalization too, especially in Europe. And let's zoom a little bit the reality in Europe. When globalization, and of course globalization was responsible for quite big benefits for a large part of the population in the world. But the promise in Europe was that globalization is uh, Will, would be a humanized globalization, a regulated uh, globalization. And what you see is that with globalization came uh, much more inequalities mm -hmm. within the different countries. And this is a problem. And this is the one bridge. It's very, how can you trust governments when you see inequalities spreading around? So it's, it's uh, we need to, to, we need, but because we need the governments. If you don't have political will, if you don't have political commitment, how are you going to connect all the dots you need, all the partnerships? Yeah. How are you, uh, how are you going, uh, how are you le lead uh, all the work that has been uh, design the, the policies, implement the policies, mm -hmm. together with the other stakeholders. But you need, you need political will. And so the main task for me is how can we build trust? How can we reconnect people and the political level? And but for me, this is the big, big, big uh, challenge. Do you, do you have a direction for an answer? Because oh. you asked the question. This is and a million dollar question, yes. Saying yes. something and about And we were that. discussing between us, uh -huh. uh, about, uh, 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 between us about, about this issue. Uh, and of course, uh, one, one of the questions that popped up was the, the short uh, and uh, electoral, um, Cycle? electoral cycles, which are, of course, uh, uh, can be a problem. Uh, I do remember a European leader that said, we all know what is to be done, but uh, if we do, we'll not be re-elected. And so, so this is uh, how... So we need the citizens to support governments in, in having much more ambitions to go further, to see further, uh, and to really push the governments to, mm -hmm. to do what is to be done. Yeah, and this, the role of the citizens is very important. The role of the citizens as such, 
the role of the citizens at private sector because no one is going to invest if it doesn't see uh, what will be the next steps. Mm -hmm. where, uh, where do you want to be in, in 10 years? If, if it's, it's not clear, they will not invest. And so we all have our responsibilities at different levels, mm -hmm. but we need political will and we need this true alliance mm -hmm. between all the stakeholders. Yeah. I think uh, you're absolutely right, of course, and I think that has already been also acknowledged in the Sustainable Development Goals. Goal number 17 is basically about partnerships, partnerships yes. between all different partners, and also the Sustainable Development Goals, contrary to, their, uh, uh, to the Millennium Development Goals, were put together uh, with the inputs of a great number of people, corporate uh, uh, partners, etc. But I, I, I also ha I, I would like to go to the issue of complexity. Basically, you touch upon complexity. Uh, and um, I, I want to quote from the book uh, Thinking the Unthinkable. We have all heard him these days, uh, Nick Going. And he had, uh, Dr. Parakana has. Uh, put a quote in his book, and it's, it, it sounds like this, and I would like to have your reactions to it. A connected world is a complex world. Once stable sand piles are cascading all around us in the economic, social and political and strategic domains. As some of today's most important government and corporate leaders confess, they feel helplessly behind the pace of change. That's quite something, guys. So how do you look at this uh, confession of leaders that they're hopelessly behind the pace of change? And how could we help them, maybe, eh, to get that changed? Who would like to react? And, and you guys can also react later on, eh? So yep. put your hands up if you want to say something. <laughs> yeah, I'll, 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 I'll have a go at it and start with, and I'll come back to systems. Loud, loud Steve. If yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll have a go at it first up, and I'll come back to systems. So if we're looking at these complex issues, if we look at the major challenges facing humanity today, they're global in nature. Things like climate change, ever-decreasing biodiversity, full use of the fresh water on the planet, and many, many other things, and we're seeing these challenges coming up daily. Now, to be able to fit in with this, we need to start to view our societies as systems, not as standalone single events which are occurring. If we start to do that, we can start to fit in with the bigger picture in which we all, our societies live and exist in. Now, one of the first things which one needs to look at when you're looking at it from a systems perspective is what is the velocity or movement of that system? So we could take the nation state. And through measures of positive peace, you can actually see the direction and the momentums of what states are going in. And they form virtuous or vicious cycles. Systems are self-propelling systems. So think of your body. All human beings are a self-propelling system. And the societies we exist in are the same. So by understanding the mechanism and the nature and the direction of those systems, we've now got some insight in ways to change it. And it's a matter of changing and focusing on the system for many, many direct, different directions simultaneously. If you look at Europe today, and you look at it through the measures of positive peace, from systemically, if we go back over the last five years, it's in what we call a vicious cycle. Now, Betley, a small one, but it's slowly decaying away. And why is it decaying? It's got a loss free flow of information, the acceptance of rights of others is on the decrease, well-functioning government is falling, Level, perceived levels of corruption are on the increase, and the equitable distribution of resources. But to fix it, we need to tackle all those things in the systems, and generally, what most of us do, and when we think from a government perspective, we'll hit one, two, three, four of those things, particularly the ones which we think a hot in the electorate today. Uh -huh. mm. Thank you. Hannon? Well, I think leaders really need to be constantly assessing what are the opportunities and the risks out there. You need to have in your mind always a foresight uh, uh, you know, a approach. What's coming down the track 
could be good, it could be bad, but you, you better be aware of it. Otherwise, you're always going to be reacting, reacting, reacting instead of getting uh, ahead of the curve. It, it's absolutely true that you know, we see much more interconnectedness between uh, issues now. I mean, if I think back you know, 20, 30 years, were political events having the effect on economies and the global economy that they have today? No. But now, you know, you get a political event like, like Brexit, which was fundamentally a political convulsion, huge economic consequences, not just for the, the country at the epicenter of that storm, but, but, but right around. So it affects currencies, affects, affects growth rates, affects all sorts of things. So just, you know, always be thinking what's coming down the track and also taking the public into your confidence about what, what you see coming. You know, a, I think a degree of transparency about uh, where leaders think the trends are and what the consequences are for the country are, are very important to communicate. Absolutely, and mm. but maybe follow-up question, then I'll give you the, 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 the floor. Uh, so so would, do we think here in this panel, do you think that the present-day leaders have the knowledge and capacities and skills to lead towards that transformational future? And we, we had this before in several groups, that the system, any system, can hold a good leader back. And, so, and also, do the leaders of today who have grown up as leaders in a different system, in an old kind of old system, do, are they up to the challenge to lead for the future? So I would like to hear that first uh, Suzanne and then you, Miguel. Well, and then the, 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 the room. Clearly, clearly. The complexity, and it was already yeah. mentioned, is mm. multidimensional. Mm. You know, I was, I was listening to the perspective from the local government, and it's true that it's the local government that is closest to the delivery on, 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 on the services and the needs of the citizen. But at the same time, we need a global governance to address some of the most acute issues we have, like climate change. Mm. Uh, this is it's, it's very interesting, it's, it's not either or, it's all of the mm -hmm. above. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the connectivity between the issues and the speed of change is such that I don't believe anybody's fully prepared for it. Mm -hmm. I do think that there is a disconnect between a vision and action, which is a big problem. And you find often people who are visionary, who can inspire, but then cannot transpire into action. And you have people who are able to get things done, but don't have that vision. We need to be able to make that connection because what is before us is challenging, is difficult. People will, ha all of us will go through tough moments so we need to be aware of that. We need to pre be prepared for that. We need to have somebody who tells us this is the way moving forward and get the hope and the able to make it operational to while you get it done, you, you get the sense that yes, the light is at the end of the tunnel. This is something that is true. Some people can have as natural gifts, but you also learn and I think there is not, not enough investment on preparing leadership for now and for the future. Okay, interesting perspective. <coughs> Again, and then I Just want to give you the... Yeah. A comment on, on, this, on, on this disconnection between vision and action uh, with, a, with an example that I've experienced myself. European Union, seven years ago, has decided that solar panels would be the, the, the next big thing. So European Union closed the borders and uh, 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 created uh, new lines for, for, to support entrepreneurs to create new plants to produce solar panels. Since this decision, vision, till the first euro uh, <laughs> arrived to a company, seven years uh, uh, passed, and China, and China already was already leading uh, 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 the world on solar panels. Mm -hmm. Next step of the European Union was, okay, Solar panels are not anymore the next big thing. The next big thing is to control the knowledge on battery, te battery technology. So again, new decision, vision, and the action took three, four, five, five years for the first year to go to the first company to, to invest in, in, in batteries. And not, again, China is leading the pack, is leading the world mm -hmm. on battery technology. So what is lacking in this, in this uh, gap between vision and action? Institutions. Mm -hmm. governance model. European Union, Union has a governance model that has changed 
Uh, it's better now than, in, than it was uh, uh, 30 years ago, and it's better than 20 years ago, and it's better than 10 years ago. But the pace of that change is not enough for, for the, the, the change that the world is experiencing now, right now. Uh, um, again, and answering what the deputy minister was saying, uh, the lack of trust, how can we trust in an institution like the European Union when you will have double standards like Port Portugal and Greece and Spain were penalized because they, they've not, they not comply with the deficit, uh, 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 with the, the threshold of deficit? Okay, that's fair. We have to comply with the rules. We live in a community that have to comply with the rules. But again, on the other side, you have Germany with the biggest surplus, uh, uh, trade surplus in the world, the biggest in the world, for four years in the, in the row, more than 8.5% of uh, 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 trade surpluses. And the treaties are clear on penalized this kind of surpluses, and no, nothing mm -hmm. is done. So okay, you are so a part of a community <laughs> where, where you have double standards. And double standards is a, the, the, a part of the answer of the lack of trust uh, uh, on politicians and on institutions. Okay. Quickly, you and just, then I have very to really quickly, because I <laughs> very promise. quickly on that on institutions yeah. double standards. I fully agree, and 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 we have a problem with that in at the European Union level, but in many levels. But let me talk about China and the rest, because there we have a big question before us, which is what kind of government we want to live in. And China has decided that they will deliver on economy, they will deliver on results. They have made a huge, huge transformation. 600 million people out of poverty, so plus, plus, plus. But they have decided to do that in a fast pace, overcoming all the, the, the limitations that a government like a democracy will, will put before them. Yeah. And it's a trade-off. Uh -huh. And I'm not saying here, I'm not defending either or, but what I'm saying is we need to be aware that every fork in the road is an, a decision and it's a trade-off. Uh -huh. But then still, yeah, no, that's a very good point. Still, your point also stands that, uh, and, and the question I pose that whether the leadership we have in the European Union and future leadership of the European Union is able to accelerate decision-making, vi vision decision-making, and implementation. Uh, yeah, but when you have <laughs> consultation, consultation takes time, I know, for but, example. But <laughs> you know, sometimes you, know, you need to speed up the system. So are we able to do that? So the, the, the room. I think, sh uh, well, anyway, uh, you can go and then you, uh, Samantha, some others. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and we'll take a few questions and then have the answers. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So people with disabilities, how can we include them, uh, catalyze the, uh, the knowledge that is there in the world on, on uh, their issues? Uh, please, uh, microphone here, front. Thank you. Uh, question Quick question, second Quick question. <laughs> Definitely, yes. Okay, so po populism and how to tackle the questions people pose uh, and that they, are li that they really live with. How to, yep? Uh, so it's just very simple. Um, the Local government, local, uh, government 
Okay. Cities, yep. Is it, so you were talking about the social contract, basically? Right. Mm. Yeah, that's that's an interesting point. Also, <laughs> I think it came, it came back several yeah, times. Whether you know, uh, the organizing principle that we live with, national uh, uh, nations, the nation states, whether they are not now becoming kind of obsolete, kind of uh, standing in the way. So, uh, what I would like to ask you, just who would would like to come up, Helen? And well, well, just uh, addressing a couple of them. Firstly, uh -huh. I'm really pleased disability has been raised because when we talk about leaving no one behind. One of the groups always at risk of being left behind is people with, with disabilities. We do have a UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disability. It needs to be implemented. Uh, that requires a lot of change for a lot of societies, but it, it's something that would one, one would hope everyone would enter into with goodwill and also ensure that the disability organisations have access, have voice with decision makers uh, at all levels of government. Second point I was going to pick up was the question which I think said, uh, with populism, it, people are raising issues, right? They need to be addressed. And I, I do think that at the core is, is really this feeling of quite significant size constituencies that somehow life has left them behind. The jobs have gone. You know, you might have been in the town where there was one company. It's closed. It might have been manufacturing. You've seen the jobs go somewhere else. Where I think not enough states uh, have accepted their responsibility is in supporting transitions in the world of work. And they better get that right, because this fourth industrial revolution and the artificial intelligence, the digitization, that's bringing a, a tidal wave of change. Now, I think we are sufficiently ingenious as human beings to, to navigate and ride that, but we have to invest in our people, our structures, our connectivity, you know, skills, retraining, <laughs> relocation of necessary. There's a lot that has to be done. If you leave people to cope on their own in the face of these, these very broad and even global forces, and they get left behind, you can't be surprised they're grumpy. Mm -hmm. mm. You know, I, I was talking with Paul Krugman uh, not long ago, and I asked him, why is it that they missed so much the reading of what was coming and the Trump won? Mm. And he said to me, we had a georeferencing problem. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? Well, overall, the Obama administration created four million jobs. But guess what? Those jobs were created in the coast, both coasts. Yeah. And they were lost in Iowa and other places. The one living in a little town in Iowa couldn't care less about the jobs created in the coast. They were too far, and the skills required were not his or hers. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem. It's going back to the notion of connecting to the needs of the people. And regarding populism, the problem is you cannot promise those people that you will go back in history to solve the issues, which is what often happens. You need to find a narrative, a yeah. truthful narrative that says, that's how we're going to get there, and this is what we are going to do. And it's going to be painful, but in my view, and this is my view, the government shall be there for you. So safety nets, ways to provide for the transition, those things are needed, and that's what brings governments closer to people, and that's where you need policies that do not must be defined at the, at, the global, at the national level. On the question of disabilities, I agree, we are behind, and it's a problem, and we have to work on that, but I have to say Argentina is not only behind on that issue, we have other issues also that we need to invest and work on, but that's one of them. Mm -hmm. Last but not least, very briefly, on the question of local and global. Some people argue that the articulation of the future is going to be local and global without the national government in the middle. It's a big, big governance change. 
uh, uh, many argue in the UN that cities are not properly represented when they really, really have the bulk of the problems that citizens uh, uh, view as central. So it is a major <sighs> departure from what we have. Maybe that's something that we will evolve to. But in the meantime, the question of uh, negating the responsibility of the central go national government on what it has to do is also a problem. Okay, thank you so much. So, few snappy uh, remarks, please, and then I want to ask the room what they would like to, uh, say, convey to the people here, and so also in words. So, think of what you still would like to discuss next time, or, you know, wh where your questions are, and then we can work on trying to answer them next time, or in the meantime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. We are going to round off now. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, very well, and going back to, to the governance, to the global governance and to the local governance, uh, yes, to forget, to forget this uh, national governance, as uh, uh, Susanna just mentioned, uh, seemed to me a, a big, big change, and that's not going to happen in the, in the next few years, so let's put our cheat to the future. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but it's true that territories will have an impact an increasing importance in the global governance, that for sure. Another thing I would like very much to, uh, to mention here, because it's, uh, it's, it's something that gives us uh, um, some food for thought, uh, is that uh, we cannot answer complexity with simple answers. This is, uh, this is yeah. fatal, this is lateral. Um, and this is what, what is happening in Europe, for example. When you say to people that, uh, yes, you close the borders, you, uh, then it will be uh, the disaster because you simply cannot address global challenges uh, on your own uh, at, at the national level. So really, this is not the speech uh, we need. Uh, and this is not, but unfortunately, this is the speech we have on the table, uh, and this is the speech that is embodied by some of the leaders uh, in Europe and everywhere, not only in Europe, but uh, all over the world. And this is very dangerous. And what we see now is that we, we, we can, we assist to a very a tension um, between independence and sovereignty, as if they were, uh, if you have, to have your sovereignty, you need independence, which means uh, you need to have the power to decide at the national level. No, yeah. you will lose power if you are left alone uh, at your national mm -hmm. level mm -hmm. without being included mm -hmm. in a regional and in a global um, realities or alliances or whatever you want. Thank you so much. Very and, then, and then Steve, and then mm -hmm. we'll round so up for I, now. I, I completely agree with the Deputy Minister. And uh, just to add something, I, I'm a member of a Global Mayor's Parliament. Mm -hmm. That is an initiative that uh, 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 looks to the future, distant future, of having just cities running the world. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I don't believe in, in that mm -hmm. vision. Actually, I completely uh, uh, believe that national uh, governments are absolutely essential yes. Uh, 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 for the success of the world governance system, mm -hmm. first of all. Second, I think, and I completely agree with Suzanne, that uh, uh, cities are not well represented in the current uh, uh, institutional model, European level and global level. And we have to change it. Otherwise, you know the name of Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, you know the, that Blasio is the mayor of New York, but you don't know the, 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 the name of the man that is in charge of Greater London or the, the, the government or, of New York. Mm -hmm. But you know Sadiq Khan and you know Vlasio. So something is changing already mm -hmm. and we can't be Definitely. completely blind and do, don't do nothing. So mm -hmm. national uh, governments are essential, but we have to change and to redesign the model, yeah. uh, reshape the model, because in this new world they will have new roles uh, 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 to be played in this new institutional uh, governance model. Thank you so much. Steve, last one. But two, please, yeah, yeah, two points. very quick points. The first, unless we have a world which is basically peaceful, we'll never get the levels of trust, cooperation or inclusive necessary 
to solve the major challenges facing humanity today because they're global in nature. And that is different than any other epoch in human history. In the past, peace may have been the domain of the altruistic, but in the 21st century, it's in everyone's self-interest. The second point is the rate of change, the rapid rate of change is beyond what governments are capable of solving with the way they're going about viewing societies and running it today. What we're doing is we're focusing on problems. Problems are like an event, and there are more and more problems which are overwhelming us. We need to come back and look at all of this as a system and start to think about how to actually tackle it as a system. Because if you get the inputs correct, the encoded norms correct, then it's a self-perpetuating system which stops the major problems from arising. Okay, well, thank you so much. I think you left us with a lot of food for thought. Um, have peace as a prerequisite for any inclusive, sustainable social economic development. The different levels of governance and governments, uh, how to reconcile them, how to speed the issues up, how to see to it that visions are being operationalized in the speed that is needed to face the challenges of today and the ones of the, fu of the near future that are speeding up already. So, you know, we have a lot of issues on the plate here uh, that, we need to, uh, uh, that we need to solve. The, the personal leadership qualities of leaders, uh, you said we don't invest enough in them. Um, the European Union, too slow, too little, too late, basically, you said. Um, well, of course, we have some inspirational examples here also. And I would like to thank the panel, but I would like to ask you also, have you heard the issues that you told us in the beginning were important? Have you heard them back? Do you feel that the panel has addressed these issues? And do you miss something that you really would like to discuss, discuss next time? It's also good for Frank, so that he knows what to tackle next time, at least as an issue. So is anybody, uh, anybody wants to yell something? Just, just yell a word, yell a word. No, we don't have time anymore. So, accountability, okay. accountability, good word. I wanted, I wanted to say to, to, to you guys and... Uh, just uh, one sentence. ...about the uh, women forum that you're doing. I live in New York and I run a forum on ah. the global issues for educational issues for African girls. And I wanted to find out what you're currently doing uh, to help African girls in terms of women empowerment. Okay, perfect. Okay, so, so that, that's an issue. Well, you can, she does a lot. How to build courageous leadership? How to build courageous leadership? The how. Feminist foreign policy? Okay, maybe we could then watch together Margaret Wallstrom's uh, uh, video, I don't know whether you've seen, there's a documentary on Margaret Wallstrom's Feminister, really worthwhile watching, and then we can also discuss the issue. Please, one word. The Arctic. Okay, so basically the climate change as an, as an, as an. Okay. Okay. How to cope with these, these challenges? Quick. Youth as drivers for change. Economic zones. Repatriating the 30 trillion dollars set in offshore accounts. Repatriating the 30 trillion dollars set in offshore accounts. Who? That is about corruption and, and tax evasion. Quick, quick. Okay, yeah, level yeah. playing field of taxation models, etc. Okay, tax evasion. Well, the last ones, the last of the Moeckens here today. <laughs> no, they did fantastic, and I really want to give them a big hand. Thank you so much, Teresa, Miguel, Susanna, Steve, and Helen. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>